And the only two thoughts that really kept me going through that time was what would my grandfather think and what would my teacher think. And that was it. That's all I had. Hello, everyone. It's episode 88 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Guru Chris Thompson. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but I'm also your host here for Martial Arts Radio. I'm proud to say that Whistlekick makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as really great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you listening for the first time. If you're not familiar with our products, you should take a look at what we make. Our shin guards are pre-shaped to your shins so they don't move around, and they're double thick right where it counts, but they still have plenty of ventilation. Check them out at our website, whistlekick.com. Now, if you want to see the show notes, those are on another website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, get on the newsletter list. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month, we never sell your information, and sometimes we mail out a pretty generous coupon. On episode 88, we're joined by Guru Chris Thompson, a former karate practitioner turned Filipino martial arts student and ultimately instructor. He's a frequent site on the seminar circuit and really feels passionately for the art he's chosen. He's a dangerous man with a stick or a knife, or even unarmed but he's also a really nice guy and it was a pleasure to have him on the show. Enjoy. Guru Chris, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you for having me. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure to have you here. I think this is going to be great stuff. You're going to be coming from a, a, a varied perspective. We're going to get some different answers out of you as we do from all of our guests. And uh, I'm not going to spoil any of that stuff for the listeners, but <laughs> let's jump into it. Um, I know you've kind of got two phases of your martial arts path, but let's go way back. All right, yeah. Let's start at the beginning. Yeah. How, how, how did you get into the martial arts? Well, ironically enough, I got into it when I was about 16, and uh, a little bit of the background of the family information. My mother had you know, four kids, and I basically got a job, started paying for it on my own. I had a friend that he literally drove me all the time. But I originally started off doing uh, traditional Okinawan Goju Karate out in uh, Central Square, New York at the time. So it's about uh, 20 minutes north of Syracuse. And uh, it was under James Coker, who is a very good person that I trained with. I was doing that for a very long time. I got to about third degree in the traditional karate aspect of it. I got to the second degree in the Kobodo weapons of it, actually under Frank Van Letten, who James Coker was associated with, too. And I was did that for about what was it, 12 to 13 years straight. You know, loved it, did it all the time. You know, we did a lot of forms back then. You know, did a little sparring. At, oh, we did sparring, of course, but, you know, it wasn't my main thing there. But just did that. And then about the 13th year, I came across Filipino martial arts with a different teacher. And then I started learning that art there. It was doing JKD and Filipino martial arts. So I started getting into that a little bit. And I really loved it because I just loved weapons in general. So that's when I started making the transition over. And, you know, I finished up and you know, still uh, worked with James Coker for a while. You know, because I taught at a school the whole nine yards. And eventually just went straight to FMA and focused strictly on that. I've been doing that since 16 years straight now, too. So it's been nonstop for that. I just love it. I've actually gotten three different instructorships in it now, two in Inosano System Kali directly, and then the new one, which is in the Bahalana uh, original Hiron Screaming System, directly from Grandmaster Michael Hiron. So loving that art and just keep expanding on that all the time. That's great. So there are kind of the two pieces that I hinted at, you know, the, the Japanese side, the, yeah. the karate, the kabuto, and now the Filipino side. Now, anyone that has trained in distinctly different arts knows that there's always a compelling reason, or I should say usually a compelling reason. For some, it's that they move or the instructor retired, but generally there's something that you find that you didn't have prior. So I'm wondering if you would be willing to share with us, was there something about karate and kabuto that you, were, you felt was missing 
from your training or from your life? Well, see, this is, you know, I have to be very careful I say it because I don't want to say anything wrong to upset anybody. And it's nothing against them. I just, we did so many forms. By the time I got done, I think I had about 50 empty hand forms, 30 weapon forms, but there wasn't that street combative aspect to it. And that's something that I really wanted. You know, I'm all about the, you know, you got to have the real the street defense aspects to it, combatives for the military people so they can be safe and come home. Those are major focuses for me. And, you know, all the stuff they're doing is great. You know, I, I respect all the traditional arts, which just it wasn't the right niche for me is all it was. So finding this art and the focus required out of it was a totally different level for me that I liked a lot better. It's very dynamic in how it worked. So I just enjoyed it more and gravitated to what I liked. And I can sense you, you know, you're really being diplomatic and that's okay. Uh, and I, but I don't think that you have to feel defensive. You know, I don't think there are a lot of people that are going to be out there listening to this saying, oh, well, you know, forget him. He, you know, he gave up on what he had or, or, or whatever, you know, some people might be theorizing. I think a lot of us that have trained in traditional arts, especially arts that emphasize forms training. We've all had a conversation with someone, you know, it might be a someone who watches or trains in MMA or or what I might call more of a, a modern martial art like Krav Maga or something that mm -hmm. emphasizes the combatives aspects. But you hit the nail on the head, at least for me, for the way I nail it, it wasn't right for you. Yeah. And I think that that's the beauty of martial arts is that there's something out there. There are different arts because there are different people. Yeah. And it's all about, you know, and I say all the time, it's like, it's what they're looking for. So when I had the school still, I had people come in looking for MMA. That's not what I do. So I sent them to the best places around for that. Traditional arts, uh, like I didn't really teach kids a lot. So I sent them to schools that were better situated to help them with what their actual needs were. You know, but yeah, every art, it's it's about finding what you like and enjoy doing the most and then pursuing that passion. Right. Now, for anyone that might not be familiar with Filipino martial arts, could you give us just a, a short primer on how the approach, the techniques of Filipino martial arts compare to arts that people might be more familiar with, like karate or taekwondo? Okay. Um FMA is extremely interesting. And FMA is just a very broad term encompassing all of it, whether it's uh, Eskrima, Arnis, Kali, Balinta Lock, or any of the other forms or styles or branches of it, I should say. Uh, it's an all-encompassing term is what we use. Just much easier to use that term. Um, FMA, it's pretty much, it's known for being a stick art and a weapons-based art, and that's what you start training with day one. But it's actually so much more than that. It's literally a comprehensive heart that covers every form of fighting there is. You have people that are strikers, kickers, and some systems of FMA look just like Taekwondo guys, for example. And uh, you got grappling arts in there as well, and just everything. You're talking empty hand grappling with knives, sticks, flexible weapons. It's, it's really comprehensive. You can do it your entire life from 8 to 80, and you'll never learn all of it. There's just so much of it out there. I'm still learning how much more is out there, but it's mostly known for that. Uh, it looks the empty hand aspects. Some of them are very similar to like uh, basic boxing, for example, but uses a lot of intricate work and a lot of footwork involved too. And it's all about, you know, whatever works and is efficient for fighting. That's what they use. There wasn't a lot of flash in the art because through its years, uh, you gotta understand that like in the Philippines, there's 7,107 islands. On average, originally, each island had about three different martial arts. So the Filipino martial arts, uh, basically, it's an all-encompassing term for all the different types there are. Like the major branches, so to speak, are known as either Eskrima, Kali, Arnis, or even the Puntawak systems. And in each of those, there's a bunch of different style systems, the whole nine yards. There's, it's just a general term that encompasses all of it, which makes it easier. Uh, Filipino shirts are also known a lot of times as being like a weapon-based art or stick-based art or knife-based art. And that's what most people see it as. And that's actually based on how it came up through its history, which I'll get into in a little bit. But one thing that it uh, really is does, it's a truly comprehensive fighting system. There is a lot of different areas in it where you have some systems that look just like Taekwondo systems. You have other parts that, even though they start off with the weapons, the sticks, and the knives, and all that, there actually is a comprehensive empty hand system, like uh, 
uh, striking, boxing, a lot of dirty fighting, which is a personal favorite of mine. Uh, you also have a kicking system, which is uses more low line kicks than anything else, but there are some high line kicks too. I just personally, I'm not a fan of those, but that's just me. And there's actually grappling aspects to the art that's in there too. And it really encompasses every single thing there is. Uh, to give you a little a trick answer to actually, a lot of times people will ask, uh, a lot of instructors are teaching it, like the Drew Dancer and asked this. Uh, one of my other teachers, Kevin Seems, been asked this. They're like, well, if you could only pick one art, what would you pick? And they'll tell you, Filipino martial arts, they'll say Kali. But it's actually a trick answer because they're not giving up any other art that they do because it's all incorporated into it anyway. So you could actually do versions of Thai in it, that's the striking, boxing, whatever you want. It's all there. You know, and uh, the reason why it's more known for being a stick based art is because in day one, you start out with sticks in your hand. And that's what everybody sees. That was actually based on its history because a lot of times if you had your village and you're worried about bandits coming in or you're thinking that the next village is going to attack you, which is common in the culture coming up through the years, that you had to prepare people to fight to defend themselves. So the first thing you're going to teach them how to do is the weapon. Same thing we do in our military. You're going to, uh, going to sit there and teach a soldier empty hand first thing. You're going to teach them to use the gun and get proficient with a tool that is most commonly used. So back in their day, it was the sticks is the thing they had the most. That's what they fought and trained with. So they always start off with that first, and as it progresses, it starts going to empty hand aspects later on. But that's in a nutshell what FMA is. It's it's an extremely comprehensive fighting system that covers every single range of fighting that it could possibly be. It just matter what people focus on inside it. Okay, sure. That that makes a lot of sense, and I think that that's a great primer. I'm sure we're going to get some more details as we go through the rest of our conversation today. But I appreciate you sharing that. You know, of course. Anybody that has listened to the show before knows everything we do is centered around stories. So I'd like to hear from you now. What's your best martial arts story? All right. I got one for you on that one. It's actually happened about uh, five and four years ago. So it was at the time I was doing the Filipino martial arts with Kevin Seaman only. And what happened is I decided, you know what? I really want to try to become an instructor on the Guru Dan Osano, which is not an easy thing to do. And, and, you know, Steve Kevin, he's a great guy. And I need to say that just because it can easily be taken the wrong way. But when I told him my goal, he looked at me and said, you're setting yourself up for disappointment because he knows how hard it is to get in there. He's had senior instructors that have been applying for 10 years and haven't gotten in yet. So I, I understood that, too, as I knew it wouldn't be like, oh, I want to sign up and here it is. It was not like that. It's a lot harder. So I started going to, I was always going to seminars, so but I started, you know, handing in my letter right to Jordan personally saying, hey, you know, I'd really like to become an instructor and you. And, you know, he took it back. Always, he's always a gracious man, but nothing happened right away. And then about a year and a half later, I was down in New York City at one of the seminars he was having there. And I had my daughter with me who, uh, at the time she trained with me, she was about, oh, 16 at the time, 15, 16, somewhere in there. So we're doing the seminar and they're actually doing stick and dagger work. And obviously, because I made the training blades, my daughter and I both had a set of aluminum spatty dagger, the sword and dagger. So we started doing the drills with the sword and dagger and we we're starting to go through it, you know, just having a good time. And Guru Dan actually came over because he liked what we were doing. So then in the middle of the seminar, he actually stopped it and he had my daughter and I go up in front of everybody else. And this is a really good school with a lot of really good instructors and students in it. And he had us demonstrate what we were doing with the sword and dagger in front of everybody. And it was like a very first time for me to doing this. And my daughter, she was the first time for her doing it. She's like, holy cow. And she did really well. So we, were, we started banging it out there like we always do. And then he's like, all right, go to the middle level. So we dropped down a little bit. And he's like, go to low level. So you're basically squatting down, but your knees aren't touching the ground. And we're moving around doing the whole same uh, flight sequence of the patterns. And, you know, he liked it a lot. So then at the end of that seminar, you know, I was talking to him and Guru Dan, the funny part about it was, is Guru Dan thought that my daughter was actually my wife. And, um, you know, I started having, I had a kid when I was a little bit younger, so she's 16, I'm still pretty young. And he, I'm like, no, no, this is my daughter. He's like, really? That's your daughter? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's my daughter. <laughs> but it was pretty funny though. But what happened with that, and I honestly say I got accepted in, in the system under him, is because of my daughter too. Because at the end of the seminar, I did give him the letter asking to be his instructor again. He said, I'm gonna make sure I personally give this to my wife to look at. 
And then a couple months later, I got the acceptance letter. And in all honesty, I had tears running down my face because I knew it was a really hard thing to get. and It was a hard goal. And uh, I told my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, and then she's like, you need to tell Lexi first. And you know, So I called and told Lexi, oh, I would just got out of school and I told her then. She was happy, but that was like one of the best experiences I've had or really great stories as far as I'm concerned because it's like reaching for that almost impossible goal and keep working towards it, not worried about the time frame and finally getting there. And it's something I really appreciate too. So that's that one. That's a great story. I think most of us that have trained for a little bit have at least – one person, usually, you know, a couple of people that we really look up to that that recognition, be it a black belt, be it an instructor certification, be it coming onto their seminar staff, whatever it is, means so much. And for those of us that, you know, on either side of that, whether or not you've achieved that goal or or you have, I think we can all put ourselves into that place and know how much that means to you and how much it meant to you at the time. I mean, that that's phenomenal and thank you for sharing that you know it's kind of an emotional piece and i appreciate your openness with it yeah it was a fun one that was, was definitely a really good day <laughs> yeah yeah good day is probably an understatement you were probably riding high for a little while on that one. Oh, you could say that <laughs> <laughs> so let's pretend for a second that you know at at 16 you weren't interested in martial arts or you didn't have anyone around to teach you martial arts for whatever reason you didn't find martial arts at all. What do you think your life would look like today? Ooh, I was a, had major, major, major anger issues. You know, I was that small kid who got picked on and, you know, typical of most martial arts, as far as I'm concerned, they always have the people that they've been picked on the whole nine yards, but I never really fit in anywhere. I mean, I was not happy. I was mean to everybody. Even people who tried to be nice to me, I was just a very hostile kid. And you're talking anyways from like the age of five up. I was that way. I was just always angry all the time. And um, I would not like the person I would have been. And there was a point in my old life when I was a little older, actually, you, know, you take that hard look in the mirror at yourself and realize you don't like the person you are. So you, either you continue on the path, ignore the mirror, or you start to make the changes and become a better person for yourself and knowing how i was as a child back then a teenager how angry i was all the time i would not like the person who i would have been he's to this day for that matter i still don't understand why people from my childhood wouldn't even want to talk to me because that's how bad i was to everybody you know just to say the things that hurt them the most i wouldn't even care about or thought it's funny you know typical you know behavior at the time i guess but just not a good person that I would not talk to at this moment. Why do you think you were so angry? If if we can dig a little bit. Uh, has a lot to do with portions of my family and how we grew okay. up. It was just a bad situation. You know, my mother, she did the best she could. And I was never going to knock her on it. But there was the other side, which wasn't as good. And, you know, my parents were separated for a long time when I was young and just the way I grew up to certain environments that we came up through that weren't very pleasant areas to be in. But, you know, that's what we did. We still had family. We went forward. But there was a lot of anger from my dad's side that we had. And, you know, as I got older, I made my choices that I didn't want to be a part of that. But that's, I know a lot of it stems from that. When you started training, was it, was there a conscious effort to, address that anger piece or was that sort of just a happy accident happy accident when i first started training i mean i always wanted to train i remember being like probably four or five years old and i can't even remember what show i saw back then but i always wanted to train in martial arts and you know karate was a thing at that time especially you know so it was just getting to it and it was like hey, here's the opportunity jumped on it and kept going with it you know but the changing of me and the aspects of realizing the kind of person I was, and luckily I had some really great role models coming up through, that really helped me realize that, hey, I could be a better person than this. So, you know, so it all starts and it goes, and I'm happy with that, happy byproduct, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that that's good stuff. I think that's one of the things that parents and, and older 
adults may recognize the benefit for children, but it sounds like it was really fortunate that you wandered into the dojo yeah, well, that day, you know, w- w- I mean, who knows where you would be now. And, and, you know, I know at the very least we wouldn't have met, we wouldn't be having this conversation, oh, definitely but not. <laughs> there's probably some much bigger stuff that would be missing from your life. So, um, certainly the world is better because you found the martial arts. I'm sure of that. I'm grateful for it. You know, and everybody that helped me along the way, I'm always grateful for it because it made a huge difference for me. Good. So let's pull back out of that alternate reality, back to the real world. You did find the martial arts. We are back in today, 2016. All right. And I'd like you to think back over your life, over your time in the martial arts, and think about a challenge in your life, some difficult time. And tell us how your martial arts experience allowed you to move past that. I, I do have one in particular. Uh, we, each person has like their foundational beliefs, something that it's like your rock and your pillar, whether it's someone's religion, their family, or anything else. It could be their marriage or anything, but that's like their foundation. And it's their guiding force a lot of times. It's like no matter what kind of crap happens to them, they always have that, and it's like the security. When I was about, I don't remember exactly when, but I think it probably between 18, 19 or so, that foundation got destroyed for me. And I'm not going to go into details of what caused it, but what happened is, you know how people, you get sad, you're depressed, everything? I mean, I would gladly have traded that for what happened. Mm. Through that event, um, you kind of like fall into a void a little bit where you don't feel emotions anymore at all. Sadness is a, actually a better thing as far as I'm concerned to the void I was in. And I was in this for about five months straight. And it, to me, it was a little bit past depression, but you know, this is just, I, I didn't have any belief anymore. And that thing that I always depended on and I thought was always there for me was gone. And it shook me up pretty bad. So you're talking, I mean, I wouldn't have killed myself during that time. But for example, I mean, I didn't have a car then, so I was riding a bike back and forth to work. If a truck came at me, I wouldn't have moved. That's how bad it was for me then. And it took, it was there for about five months straight. And there was only two thoughts that really did keep me going. Because, you know, there's things I was contemplating that weren't healthy either. And the only two thoughts that really kept me going through that time was what would my grandfather think? And what would my teacher think? And that was it. That's all I had. And it was the only two thoughts that really kept me going through it. And then about five months into it, my friend that was actually helped give me a ride, he was still helping me. He basically pestered me to come back and start training again. And luckily, he pestered me enough, and I did come back. And I finally went back into the dojo at the time. It was a place where I could start to rebalance. And it took time to come out of that bad cycle I was in. But I did finally come out of it. And then I developed new sets of beliefs and foundational strengths to go with on my own. But honestly, it, that was probably one of the darkest moments I had in my life that I really didn't know how to get through. I mean, I'm sure things, a lot of things worse could happen, absolutely. But for that time, that was definitely the worst thing I went through. And martial arts definitely pulled me through it. Mm. Sounds like some, some heavy stuff. And, and I don't think we even need to hear any more of the details to get a sense of where your head was at. Because, of course, that's the important piece. and. I'm sure there are people listening now that have been in that space that have had martial arts, you know, whether or not it directly saved their life, but it reshaped their life. And I think that probably sounds like a good term for, for how you look at it. It reshaped your life. I think you used the word foundation in there. Yeah, it definitely helped. Because it, basically, that time I learned that instead of depending on those external forces, you know, you focus more on not just for yourself, not being selfish, but you believe in yourself and you use that to be your foundational strength to go forward. You know, you are responsible for you and with your actions and you can make a lot of things happen, but you just have to do it. So for me, that's how I sort of get in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think focusing on ourselves is ever selfish. I think, you know, at least in America, we have this culture that doing anything to take care of yourself is automatically selfish. And, you know, there's a, you know, that, that stereotypical example, if the masks drop, 
down from the ceiling in an airplane. You got to put yours on first so you can help everybody else. If yeah. you're not taking care of yourself, you're useless to everyone else. And of course, you know, we're all here on this big marble together. And exactly. we, we should be putting our best selves forward because that's how we all get better. Yeah. So there are going to be times that you've got to do that. And it's great that you recognize that and that you had not only the willingness, but the ability and the resources from others. Uh, you know, shout out to that person who pestered you to get yeah. you back in the dojo. I still appreciate him to this day. I've never told him that, but I still appreciate him to this day for it. Maybe you should. I, I think I you should. should. <laughs> yeah. Let him, let him know. Let him know. I think, you know, the, I think everyone has the opportunity and I think most people do actually at some point in their lives have a substantial positive impact on someone. But I think when we know that we've done that, it makes us that much more willing to go out of our way to do that for someone else. So yeah, I think you should. So you've had the opportunity to train with some, some great people. You spoke very highly of several instructors yeah. during your, your career. If you had to pick the person and let's take out those really core instructors, the people that spent a ton of time with you over years, take those out for a second. Who do you think was the most influential person in your martial arts upbringing? Uh, well, it'd really come down to the two different time frames there because uh, Jimmy Coker, James Coker, with him, obviously in the karate, he helped me a lot. You're talking like a young teenager up to a young adult. You know, he was very informative at that time and was, you know, someone I definitely looked up to and learned a lot from. But then also, again, in the FMA field, you're talking, you know, Kevin Seaman, I was with him for years. And a lot of the stuff he did was more than just the training aspect. He did a lot of stuff with the mental aspect as well, which was very informative and helped drive me in directions that were very positive, too. You know, so I, I kind of have two people that really did a lot for me to help me there. You know, then, of course, I got Rudan, a couple of them from Michael now. So there's a lot there, but those two would be the top primary ones, the most influential time frames involved. Mm. Good stuff. So let's talk about competition. Was that ever I part of, or is it part? Okay, dabbled. I, I dabbled in it. Um, my thing with that, and anyone that does it, awesome. Good for them. It's not something I'm really interested in. I mean, you know, talking to the nutritional karate days, sure, I did a couple of tournaments here and there. Did okay. You know, you know, you throw in one. If you're talking, I probably did probably three or four, and that's it. It's just, at that time, and other aspects from my life, and especially my early childhood, it's like, if you weren't the best at something, you're not good enough. And that should never be how it is. It's not that way. You put in your effort, you do your best, you evaluate, you grow from there. You know, I'm all for that. But it just, it really wasn't for me. You know, it's like, I would never, you know, people that do the tricking stuff, that's awesome. Good job. Good for you guys. It's just, that's not my cup of tea. And it just, no, not my thing. So I'm always a more about let's focus on the street based and bad aspects of it. Mm. Now, here's a question that just comes out of ignorance. Is there competition around the Filipino arts, you know, or is there stick fighting competition? There are, um, okay. depending on what type you get into too. For example, uh, a lot of it, the WeCAF tournaments is basically stick fighting tournaments. They have on armor. It's pretty good stuff. Uh, there's problems with it. It's like everything else uh, with the armor, you'll have people out there that'll just start trading blows and you're talking like in a minute round, they'll hit each other a couple hundred times. It's amazingly how fast these sticks move, but they're just trading blows to get the shots in for the point calculations going on. So they're, they're not really paying attention to the fact that, Hey, I'm getting hit. I can be damaged by this too. Then you have the other side of it where they actually are using better footwork and moving away from the attacks, you know, so the competition there, it's interesting because you got some really good stick fighters out there who are amazing uh, fighters and instructors the whole nine yards. And he's, there's one guy actually I've rumored that he can knock people out through the armor, which is ridiculously hard to do. You know, but he had that kind of power to him. You know, but um, it, it's there. And then you also have another side of this, like for example, there's the Dog Brothers who are there are their own separate entity. Really, these guys are phenomenal. They only wear, for example, like uh, hockey gloves, elbow pads, knee pads, and basically a fencing mask, you know, a super class fencing mask, and that's it. And they're using these big, heavy sticks. And they're not really about trying to tournament trophies and winnings. It's all about making each other stronger through 
higher consciousness through harder contact is what they do. And I've never done Dog Brothers, but I respect the crap out of these guys because they really put that time in there and that effort, and they, they bang the crap out of each other. They really do. But it's always also in good camaraderie, too. It's not about trying to beat the crap out of each other and hurt each other. It's about improving everybody. So, I mean, that's a really good group that's out there as well. Oh, cool. I'll see if uh, I can find some video to post over at the show notes, and, and uh, we can talk after after the show. Sure. Maybe you have some some links you can share. And for anybody that's new to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out over there, and you can see what what stuff we can cobble together to oh, put yeah. some video to this, because that sounds like something I'd really like to check out. It sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, they got some I, great videos, too. I mean, I have mad, mad respect for these guys. They're just awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've done just enough with sticks and, you know, taken a stick across the knuckles enough times to know that even when you're not trying to hurt someone, how painful it can be. So for people going at it hard, yeah, I've got a lot of respect for that. And there's a, I think it probably takes a certain kind of person to do that. And I am not that kind. Uh, yeah, they're, they're an interesting breed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, if you could train with any martial artist, living or dead, that you haven't, of course, who would that be and why? Do I have to pick just one? Uh, I'll, I'll let you pick two if you, if you sure really enough. need it. I, I do need the two. <laughs> okay. Uh, Guru Dan in Osano had a teacher called uh, Grandmaster John McCoss. He was around, uh, he died, I think it was like his 78 or 80, somewhere in that range. Uh, he, Guru Dan said to this day, he said there's some four things that he could do that Guru Dan can describe, but he still can't do. And John McCoss was kind of like the Renaissance man of Filipino martial arts. He knew so many different styles from all over the entire region. And he was just really good at what he did. You're talking, he was in the northern regions learning some of those arts. He was also down in the Muslim southern region, uh, Mindanao area, learning some of those arts. Plus, he had what he had in the Visayan regions as well. So he was really all over the place. I mean, Gurdan still speaks very highly of him to this day. And that was definitely a person I would have loved to train with. And he had a lot of good stuff to him. Now, there's the other person, and it's more of a legend, but if it's true, and it's, it's Filipino history, you know, who knows? You know, I hope it's true. But also, there's two sides of every story, so you always hear that. But there's the legend of the uh, oh, Princess Pepe is one of the names for her, and she was the blind princess is the other name that she's kind of known for. Now, are these the same people or not? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if the culture in that aspect. But some of the grandmasters claim to have trained with her, and obviously others have said that's not true. But she was supposed to be so good with the stick that even though she was blind, people could never hit her. She was that good. Like one of the stories about her is that uh, she was the chieftain's daughter of the village and she was always helping people. And eventually when the chief got older, he wanted her to marry somebody. She's like, well, I will marry them if they can beat me and stick. And you're talking years went by. No one could beat her. No one could even come close to it. And like people would come from all over the place. It's like, hey, if I beat her and I marry her, then I'll be, I'll be all set because this is the chieftain's family. You know, I'll be OK. And you're talking she'd fight. I was like, OK, I'll fight you. but you know, if you lose, then you have to become one of my bodyguards. And she would fight them, and they'd get there waiting for someone to see who their champion was, and then it was actually her, and she would just fight these guys for hours and beat them. And that was the legend of her and how good she was. So she would definitely be the other person I'd love to train with if the story is true. I'm going to have to do a little bit of research. That sounds like a pretty cool story, and not one that I've heard before. Uh, you know, a lot of arts have the the legends of, you know, some kind of blind, yeah. very yeah. proficient martial artist. I mean, that that archetype even shows up in Game of Thrones. You know, that's that's a current one that's going on right now if anybody watches that show. So Yeah. And if it's true, I would have loved to have trained with that person too. <laughs> yeah. I don't care if they're man, woman, young old, I don't care. If you can teach me, I'm happy to learn. That's how I look at it. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, how do you get better? It's by spending time with people that are better than you. Yeah, or they can share insight that you might not have seen before. You know, right. You got, I can learn from an eight-year-old just as much. and It doesn't matter to me. If they got something cool, hey, okay, show me. Let's see what this is. Let's check it out. I'm all good. Yeah, absolutely. So how about movies? Are you at all a martial arts movie guy? Ah, uh, that's a good one. A uh, little bit. I really try not to watch that much TV anymore. 
movies included in that aspect. And on average, like if I get like an hour a night, my wife, that's pretty much it for me. Uh, but there's a couple of movies out there. Now, the first one's corny as can be, but back in the <laughs> 80s, love them. it was The Last Dragon. You know, that was a great movie at the time. And of course, you have Bruce Leroy running around, you know, and showing off. That was definitely one of my favorite movies from back from that time period. More recently, there was a beer movie called Equilibrium, and that was pretty good because this is like after all the Matrix movies came out, and this was really good too. It's it was a beer movie about a future sci-fi thing, but the fight scenes were pretty good in it, and I like that one a lot too. So, kind of a two out there for you. Okay, cool. Now, we had the Last Dragon. We had Timok Gariello on the show just a few weeks ago. I don't know if you had a chance to check that out, but uh, yeah, if, if I you have haven't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it was a fun episode. I mean, the first real big movie star that we've had on the show. So a lot of fun. He's a great guy. And in the midst of a book and movie tour, cause it's the 30, 30 year anniversary of the show of the movie yeah, coming out. Right. So he's doing all this stuff. He wrote an autobiography that you can check out. Um, Links are, are in the notes for that episode. We'll link it from these show notes as well. I'd appreciate that, yeah. I definitely have to check that out and see what he's up to. Yeah. yeah, he's a good guy. Now, how about actors? Is there anybody that when you watch their fight scenes, it really resonates for you? You say, no, oh, that, that guy, I dig, his, I dig his fight style. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. I like quite a few of them. Yeah, you know, Jet Li, I like, obviously. Jackie Chan was just phenomenal how he did things. I always loved his stuff, too. And Donnie Yen's really good. But admittedly, I haven't seen enough of Donnie Yen's stuff yet to really appreciate his style. You know, I just haven't been watching a lot of TV or movies lately. Jet Li, I like his stuff a lot. Like, he had, Fist of Legend was awesome. But it's in the movies, I kind of see the same things all the time. And you're going to say the same thing about Jackie Chan, too. But Jackie Chan had that way about him of, you know, he'd do all these crazy stunts and these things that are just pretty much insane. That movie or not, it's just great how he always did it. So, I really like those three. Jackie Chan would probably be my most favorite of it. And again, I just don't have enough references of Donnie Yen to really formulate that opinion fully yet. I mean, he's there, but I just I haven't seen enough of his movies to really say this one's my favorite out of these three people. Right. Right. And of course, of the three, Donnie Yen is the one that's the most active right now. Yeah. He's going to be in the new Star Wars movie. Oh, I can't uh, wait for that. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as as a self-proclaimed martial arts nerd, I mean, Star Wars isn't my favorite movie series, but I really enjoy them. And of course, oh, yeah. lightsabers are awesome. Oh, yeah. So what could be better than the prospect of a martial arts fight scene involving Donnie Yen and lightsabers? It's, it's I'm excited for it already. I'm like, I can't wait for this to come out. And I'm definitely <laughs> got to see it in theaters for that one. You know, you got to be yes. in the big screen. But yeah, I'm so definitely looking forward to that too. How about books? If you're not a movie TV guy, are you more of a book guy? I used to be a lot into it. Uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War was always one of the top books I liked. I read that back in high school, actually, and got a lot of looks for it reading this book about war. But, you know, the strategies in there don't apply just to war. They apply to life, too. So I really enjoyed that book. Um, other books I liked is like uh, Jim Burrell had the uh, Lessons from the Masters, which was a martial arts book I liked a lot. You know, and Steve Kevin Seaman, he did his Winning Mindset book, which I've taken a lot of stuff out of that one and applied it to a lot of different areas in life. You're talking personal martial arts training, business stuff, whole nine yards. So I really enjoy those three books are like my top favorite books right there. All right, cool. Those are those are great picks. And of course, anybody that hasn't read Art of War really should. I mean, any book that stays prominent for that many years. I mean, how, how far back are we going? Five hundred years, a thousand years? I, I, I don't mind. Don't know my Chinese history, and I apologize. But I don't either on that one. I'm thinking somewhere's near it, eight to hundred to thousand, but that's a total guess on my part too. Okay. Well, it definitely wasn't written in this decade. No. <laughs> and so old. that makes it the oldest book that has been recommended on the show, and it has come up a few times. So if you haven't read it, definitely go read it, and we'll link to it Absolutely. from the show notes. So you talked a little bit about your goals and, and the things that, that keep you fired up, but 
let's expound on that. You know, okay. if you're looking at a year from now, five years, 10 years from now, with respect to your martial arts, what are you hoping to accomplish? There's a couple big ones in there. Right now, um, as I think I talked about last year when we met anyways, I'm right now I'm the only person on the East Coast with the Baha'u'llah original Hiron Eskema system, which I've been endorsed by Grandmaster Michael Hiron to teach. Now, with that one, it's bigger on the East or the West Coast, obviously. I would like to see that get just as big here on the East Coast. So I actually bring Grandmaster Michael out here once a year for an apprenticeship camp that we do. And I really want to help promote that system in this area. There's a couple people like, uh, yeah, Chris Lakov and show a couple weeks ago, or I saw his podcast a couple weeks ago, I should say. He's learning that system as well. Uh, there's other people that are learning it, a couple that are more local than me. You know, I'm just really trying to help promote that system and people that are want to learn it. Like, hey, apprenticeship camp, you know, it's not that hard to get here. It's not that much. It's, you know, really decently priced. And I'll help them learn the system as well and help promote it and get them going in the system too to develop it and get it all throughout here. I mean, my goal literally is the entire Eastern coast, you know, here's the Midwest or there's your half the states. Let's get it in the other half the states. I want it to be everywhere. You know, that's one of the big goals for that. And that's for me personally, I've been doing martial arts for a really long time now. And, you know, I've obviously, you know, I did the training blades before I'm phasing that out. I really want to start doing more DVDs and start doing more seminars in general too. I think I have a lot of good stuff I can share and I have a pretty good idea how to translate it to a lot of the different aspects of different arts, like a lot of the traditional arts, because the karate background helps with that. So, I mean, I really want to help spread FMA out there more too. It's kind of like the biggest unknown art there is. And I think it should be out there more. People should see it and appreciate what it has and incorporate it into what they do, because it's a great tool that can also help them with what they already have going on. Sure. Sure. Now, of course, one of the things, and I think I've said this on the show, my personal view of different martial arts, I think you, you take one art, you start training in it, and imagine a Trivial Pursuit piece, a pie, and you get to plug in a wedge. And then as you train with other people in other arts, you're adding pieces to your your pie, your personal martial arts pie. Mm -hmm. And you know anybody that has trained with you, anybody that's trained in FMA... You know, there's a, there's a good sized chunk, you know, there's certainly some different philosophies there that I think dovetail well with, you know, really any martial art. And I think you've got a good background with your Japanese martial arts to be able to say, you know, here are the ways that these things relate. Here's the ways that they don't relate, but com you know, maybe compliment is a, is a better word yeah. to use there. Yeah, like I know so, people like to use the word enhance a lot because like, it doesn't replace what anybody does word. already. It just, it's like, all right, so your areas, every art, if you think about it, they have their areas of expertise that they're really, really good at, but they also have areas they're not so good at. So I think it's like, hey, this art can really help enhance some of those areas that you guys might not focus on as much. You know, the BJJ guys, they're phenomenal. They're the masters of their craft. But if you can keep them out of their craft, which is a hard thing to do, it changes the game. Like in boxer, for example, and people... I don't know why they dismiss boxers now. So they're, they're actually extremely scientific in their fighting methods, and they're really, really yeah. good. You know, I, I get mad respect for everybody pretty much. But, you know, it's again, this is their aspect. They're great at it, but you take them out of that element, they do have a hard time. Just don't let the boxer hit you, <laughs> which is harder right. than you think. You know, but, yeah, it's just they all can help each other, and that's how I look at it. You know? I agree. And of course, to your earlier point of spreading Filipino martial arts on the East Coast, uh, we'll say here on the East Coast, not that this show is just for people on the East Coast or in the Northeast where we are. It's for everybody globally. We do have listeners all across the globe, which is a lot of fun to look at the numbers. But yeah. anybody that might be interested in attending that camp, please keep us updated. We'll push out the information over social media okay. as you release DVDs and other information. You know, we'll We'll get those links on the show notes here for the page and for the episode and, and keep everybody up to date on what you've got going on because, you know, we'll do what we can to help you reach those goals. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Oh, you're welcome. The more, the more you grow, the more the martial arts grows overall, and that's better for all of us. I've said it a bunch of times on the show. I think everybody should be training martial arts. So the more people we've got doing martial arts, the better it is for all of us. I totally agree with that. Now, are there any websites or social media, anything that 
you want to share with people if they want to stay in touch with you? Yep. Uh, the easiest way to get a hold of me is through my website, which is the FMA Academy, or FMA Academy, literally. And um, like I'm on there, it's info at FMA Academy. Uh, that's the main website that I use for it. You know, instead of having like the school like I used to know, I basically I teach out of my house, private lessons and the seminars are my main focus areas. Uh, I'm on Twitter at guru underscore Chris is G U R O underscore Chris. And on that, uh, Facebook, obviously, if you pull up, uh, the FMA Academy is how it'll, it'll pop up on Facebook. Uh, there's also our YouTube channel, which is FMA Academy USA, which is our unique channel name that we have. And those are the main ways to get a hold of me. And again, obviously, you always call me on the school's number, which is area code 315. 313 Kali, K A L I, or 5254. 5254. How hard is it to get that number? <laughs> yeah. So he's just saying it. I was like, wait, what is the actual physical number now? <laughs> Fun aside, completely unrelated to martial arts. I have a Google Voice number, which, you know, because I live in Vermont where uh, we have a lot of places where there is not cell service. Oh, crazy, really? you know, right? Uh, yeah. And one of those places where cell reception is poor is my house. So I have a Google voice number. I can give that out to people. It rings my cell phone and my landline. I still have one of those simultaneously. But when you sign up for a Google voice number, you get to pick from a whole bank of numbers. And I spent, I'm not joking, two hours taking all of the number options I had and punching them into a website that would give you all of the word combinations. Actually, yeah, that's actually what mine is. So technically, <laughs> the FMA Academy number is a Google Voice number that brings right to my phone. But there I did the go. exact same thing, and I got 313 Kali. I was like, oh, this is awesome. I'm taking this one. But yeah, I did the exact same thing you did, really. But that's how I do it, too. That way yeah. I always have it with me, and unless I'm busy at work or teaching, you know, I'll always answer when I can. But my hey, phone number has the word gong, like bang a gong in it. That works. And it's it's. It's rather memorable. Yeah, absolutely. So. <laughs> so as we wrap up here, you've you've dropped a lot of knowledge on all of us today. I really appreciate that. But do you have any other, let's say, some parting words of wisdom that you might want to leave us with? Yeah. You know, one thing is everybody wants to see change. And I totally agree. I'm all for, you know, people want to self-improve themselves in any way. I'm all for it. I don't care what someone's past is. I don't care what you've done. If you're trying to improve yourself, I respect that no matter what. You know, you're the mom at home that's taking care of the kids or the dad at home taking care of the kids. I was a single dad for a very long time. You know, I respect you because you're taking care of your family. You know, I don't care if you're the garbage man, the maintenance worker, you're the CEO. I respect that. But, you know, if you be the change you want to see in the world, because we all want things to be different, want it to be better, be that change. And it sounds kind of hard, but it's not really that hard. You decide how you want to be as a person and you improve upon that and just do that. And you will set examples for people and you never know. It's like one thing I say a lot of times when I'm teaching people even is a small difference can make a world of change. Or so small, I'm sorry, a small detail can make a world of difference. Uh, Sometimes with your techniques, and I'm sure you know, Grant, I don't have any background in the Taekwondo, but in the karate things, like if your techniques are not exactly right, the locks don't work right exactly, they might get out easier. A slight change in footwork can make a huge difference in your power, for example, you know, in striking ability or your defenses. But, you know, you might be thinking it's no big deal that you smiled at somebody that day or talked to them and said hi to them, but that might be the highlight of their day. And you never know. So be the change you want to see. And, you know, even if it's this little thing that you think isn't a big deal, it's a huge deal to someone. And that's how you got to look at it. You know, it's, you might not see it. You might not ever realize it. Just like, you know, I talked about before with that bad stuff that happened, that friend that pestered me and going back to class it made a huge difference. And there's other people have done that too. We all have it. It's just a matter of seeing it, you know, so or appreciating it too. But be the change you want to see. And, you know, small differences make a, uh, yeah, yeah. Small details make a huge difference. You know, that's what I'm all about with that stuff. Thank you for listening to episode 88 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Garo Chris. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes, including some incredible video of Filipino martial arts competition, links to Garo Chris's videos, and plenty of other offerings. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing or using one of our free apps. 
They're available on both iOS and Android. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember, we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, and if we find your review there and mention it on the air, be sure to email us for your free box of Whistlekick stuff. If you haven't left us a review yet, please do help us out and leave one. Those reviews are a lot more important than you may think. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show topic or some other feedback, there's a place over there to do that as well. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is always Whistlekick. Every episode is also on YouTube, so check us out there if you have a chance. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like our great shin guards. If you're a school owner or a team coach, you should check out wholesale.whistlekick.com for our discounted wholesale program. But that's it for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Don't hit stop yet. Guru Chris is going to be one of our featured instructors at this summer's martial arts weekend training event. You can learn more about Filipino martial arts right from the source. One low fee covers all of your meals, gets you a private room, and even an event shirt. Come train with and learn from these amazing martial artists we've assembled. You won't want to miss it. Check out martialartsweekend.com for more information or to sign up. Okay, now you can hit stop.